<clears throat> Pursuant to order made on Tuesday, November 27, 2018, the House will now revert to the rubric motions. Mr. Ouellette, seconded by Ms. Jolibois, moves that the 66th report of the Standing Committee on Procedure and House Affairs, presented on Tuesday, June 19, 2018, be concurred in. Debate. The Honourable Member for Winnipeg Centre. Mr. President, I J'aimerais partager mon temps de parole avec le député de Denis, Mississippi, Churchill River, s'il vous plaît. Je viens de dire dans la langue cri que je suis extrêmement fier d'être ici. Je suis, et vous êtes toutes mes relations. C'est un, un, un accueil, une manière de se dire bonjour à la tous. Et ce n'est pas seulement pour nous autres ici au Canada, mais c'est parler avec les êtres humains, les personnes avec lesquelles je suis en relation mais également de dire à toutes les personnes et toute la création que nous sommes ensemble. Language and culture are extremely important. They are not distinctive. But indigenous languages have been dying now for over 150 years. They have been ignored for generations, suppressed actively by government. But I am proud to say that we are entering a new age when this is no more we will be getting a fighting chance to ensure the survival of Indigenous languages. When I was first elected to the House of Commons, I had a dream. A dream that a grandmother from her reserve could turn on the television and watch the great debates of Parliament in her Indigenous language, whether it was Cree, Ishnabeg, in an Iroquois language, in Innu, any language across Canada. And I think it's extremely important that that dream be realized. But we face grave difficulties because there is no central authority to enable that grandmother to have that uh, television on. Even though we have CPAC in French and English, it does not exist for Indigenous languages. Now, in places like Little Pine, Musomin, Mosquito, Grizzly Bear, Sweetgrass, Poundmaker, and Red Pheasant First Nation, where my people are from, they have been calling out for many years about their desire to see indigenous languages, the Cree language, heard and spoken in this place, the people's place. And if Canada is to fulfill it's the dream that we have for each other, if we are to fulfill the vision that was laid out for Canadians in our constitution and our charter, then I think the full welcoming of Indigenous languages into this House is long overdue. And I think every party in the House can agree to this, that if we are truly, if we are truly to be a great nation, that everyone should know that this is their nation, whether they have been here only one day or they have been here since time immoral, since the rivers have flown and the grasses grow. I would like to thank the members of the PROC Committee who spent innumerable amount of hours fighting for Indigenous languages in this House. The Honourable Members, the great Honourable Members from Yukon, St. Catharines, Halifax, Laurentides Labelle, Winnipeg North, Brampton North, Costa Bay's Central Notre Dame, the Minister now of Seniors, York Centre and Kitchener Centre. These members who are not Indigenous spent countless hours fighting for the Indigenous languages, as well as members from the opposition, the loyal opposition, as well as the third party, also spent countless hours fighting for Indigenous languages, even though there might be little or no benefit to them personally in their families, to their personal histories, to the history of what they saw or their old vision of what Canada might have been. Yet, nonetheless, they stood up for each and every one of us in Canada. When I was first elected in 2015, I went to see Annette Trimby at the University of Winnipeg. And uh, we sat down for a lovely meeting. And she said, there are a few things I need some help with. One is some funding. But also, there was a desire at the University of Winnipeg to expand language training. And when I was a professor at the University of Manitoba, I spent many years trying to increase the amount of language programming that we had at the University of Manitoba. 
But the University of Winnipeg with Annette Trimby was particularly interested because they wanted to combine it with modern technology, with data, but they lacked the amount of large metadata to feed the algorithms to ensure that they could have uh, adequate translation so that the computers could actually be able to translate properly indigenous languages. There were a lot of books written in children's books, uh, written, but they often are not always a living language. So I would like to thank Wab Kanu, who was the previous Associate Vice President of Indigenous Languages at the University of Winnipeg. I'd also like to thank Dr. Curry, the Dean of Arts, Dr. Glenn Mulaisen, who also invested a, a large amount of personal time to even learn the Indigenous languages. I'd like to thank Dr. Jacqueline Romano, who offers for credit courses in Cree and Ojibwe. The language instructors in the department include Darren Crochet, Annie Boulanger, and Ida Bear. The department also supports an intensive two-week Learn to Speak Ojibwe program. The program is designed to teach beginner and intermediate Ojibwe and involves classroom and fieldwork. The fieldwork is held at the Medicine Eagle Camp and includes traditional teachings on medicine, beating, drumming. And funding for this has been provided by Indigenous and Northern Affairs Canada and Indigenous Services Canada. There is also a University of Winnipeg undergraduate student, Cameron Lozinski, who is currently developing an app to make his ancestral language, Swampy Cree, more accessible. Dr. Lorena Fontaine, academic Indigenous lead at the University of Winnipeg, completed her PhD on Aboriginal languages rights in Canada. And she was working with the Manitoba Aboriginal Languages Strategy of Manitoba, Red River College, with Rebecca Chartrand, University College of the North, University of Manitoba, and the Manitoba Provincial Government to develop a certification program for Aboriginal language speakers that are not teachers. She has also been an Aboriginal language rights advocate for 12 years, both nationally and internationally. The university also has been brought bringing faculty, students, and the public to learn from. This includes examples like Do Dr. Anton Trunier, Professor of Ojibwe at Bay at Bay Midji State University, and Octaviana Trujillo, Professor of Applied Indigenous Studies at Northern Arizona University. Now, community programming continues to go on at the University of Winnipeg with the We Chi Wachanak Learning Center, which provides options to community to learn Ojibwe. And the weekly classes are held free of charges for all ages, taught by Andeg Muldrew. Andeg is a linguistic student at the University of Manitoba, where he's also a sessional instructor for Ojibwe. This is extremely important. All of these individuals have had a role in trying to get our languages so that they could survive. There is currently no large scale or no government agency which ensures that there is a central type of standardization. That when you stand up in the House of Commons, that we will have an agreed upon word for what it means to be a member of parliament. Otis, tamakeo. And so if we can start to have use the Parliament of Canada to allow us to have greater translation, to have interpretation, and have interpreters from across Canada of the Cree language working together, coming up with the actual specific terms, making Indigenous languages living languages like they are in French and English, to ensure that they can survive into the future, so that my children will have the opportunity of actually turning on the television and being proud. This all started as well, not only with a conversation with Dr. Annette Trimby, but when I stood up in this house to make a member statement over a year and a half ago, and I spoke in only Cree about violence against women for the Moosehide campaign, which I wear proudly on my lapel here. And my members, there was some laughter in the chamber because no one could understand what I was saying. And I made a point of privilege asking the speaker, you, Honourable Speaker, whether my rights had been violated. And you looked into the standing orders to discover if the rights had been violated or not, and you determined that it was up to the House to decide. And you took the sage decision to ask the PROC Committee to investigate, to come up with a report, to use the processes that we have in this place to come up with the right decision. And I must thank you as well for taking that courageous decision to push this issue forward, as well as the members in this House. Because if you hadn't done so, you might have had myself who would be very disappointed, but also your actions will hopefully allow my children's children to have the opportunity 
of speaking an indigenous language. And that, I think, is the greatest gift that you have given uh, to this place in your time as speaker. And I look forward to reading the rulings that you have put forward. The, the, read the rulings in the book that will come out once you are no longer speaker. And this, I believe, will be the very first one because it will be extremely important to the history of our nation and to what we are able and have demonstrated what we're able to do in this place. So I'd just like to say thank you in Mi'kmaq, Wola La Liuk, in Cree, Ikosane, Ikse, and in Anishinaabeg language, Miigwech. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Tapuyakikituam, hai hai. May I say that it's an honor to hear in this place languages that have been spoken here in this land for thousands of years. Now remember for this, Nathie Mississippi Churchill River. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Across the way, I want to ask. My apologies. I, my apologies. I got a bit carried away, it seems, and forgot that we have questions and comments, of course, following uh, the speech. Now, remember, so I apologize. It member, member has a question. So we'll go. To, uh, perhaps she thought that I was asking her on a question to, to raise her a question, and I'll let her do that. I'm asking you a question of my colleague across the way. I'm curious. Today is a really remarkable day in moving forward as we're building bridges and in the right direction. I understand that the, the, my colleague across started off with his, his language and then stopped and delivered the rest in English. Can he explain why? Honorable member for Winnipeg Centre. Uh, the House of Commons only allows translation into English and French, but it it is my dream that one day, uh, when we hit, well, turn on the television on CPAC, because we have more Indigenous members from across the country who are elected to, to the People's House, that at some point in the future, that when we turn on the television, we can watch it in Cree, and the grandmother can watch the great debates of our parliament, but also the young children will be able to hear that language in the background and know that it is important, that it is not a forgotten language, that it is not something that is not worthwhile but it is actually spoken and heard of on TV, on the internet, and it has value, and it has value to them and their self-esteem, and it will lift our people up and raise them so that our young people can be successful and reach their full potential. Uh, questions and comments? Uh, the Honorable Parliamentary, oh, the Honorable Member for Honorable Deputy de Laurenti de la Belle. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I know I'm fairly hard to see back here. The, um, a quick question for my, my colleague. The recommendations of Proc Report number 66 are specifically written in a way to allow and encourage members of the House of Commons who are not Indigenous to learn those languages and to use them in this place. I wonder if he has any comments on the, on the importance of that, I've, as we've seen from a colleague from Idlis in Montreal. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. For Winnipeg Centre. Uh, actually, uh, Mr. Speaker, it was quite interesting uh, when the member from Ville Marie um, um, was, uh, gave a speech in, in Mohawk, and um, it was interesting to note that when we, uh, I placed my video online of me speaking Cree, uh, no one took uh, much notice uh, at first. Uh, you know, a few people were interested, but I must say when a non-Indigenous person took the time uh, to speak Mohawk, uh, people became very excited, over hundreds of thousands of views on that video, and it made a lot of people really quite proud because it wasn't just an Indigenous person trying to stand up in the House of Commons for their own language, it was others doing it for them. And he has spent considerable hours learning uh, the Mohawk language. He's been taking exams uh, monthly, uh, spending considerable hours, uh, not every day, but as much as he possibly can with his duties here in the House of Commons. And so it's a, it's a great thing, I think, when other MPs take that time to learn someone else's language. And in essence, the way and the world view, people see the world and how they think and to learn a culture. And it shows a great openness and a truly an open spirit of, um, uh, of a nation-to-nation -nation ideal. Merci, Monsieur le Président Oshlaga, un village autochtone. Le symbolique d'entendre et de parler des langues autochtones à la Chambre des communes du Canada, c'est quelque chose, c'est une image très forte. Alors, ça, c'est vraiment un excellent pas dans la bonne direction. 
Mon collègue parlait de, des langues qui disparaissent, euh, des, des anciens qui parfois ne parlent plus les langues, des jeunes qui ne parlent plus les langues. Il a aussi dit qu'il y avait des, des, des gens qui apprenaient les langues autochtones à, à d'autres, mais il me semble, moi, et je, je, je vais lui demander s'il est du même avis, que le gouvernement fédéral pourrait aider euh, les, des communautés à pouvoir euh, aider les, les anciens, en fait, les, les sages, à apprendre les langues aux plus jeunes. Alors, est-ce qu'il voit des façons dont le gouvernement fédéral pourrait aider à promouvoir les langues autochtones dans les communautés autochtones? député de Winnipeg Centre. C'est certain, ça va aider euh, les Canadiens et aussi euh, les peuples autochtones à apprendre leur propre langue. Ça va crier haut et fort que c'est important. Nous avons entendu cette semaine les débats au sujet de la fierté des francophones pour leur langue sur tous les côtés de cette Chambre. Et c'est la même chose pour les peuples autochtones. Mais souvent, les ressources ne sont pas là. Souvent, les enseignants ne sont pas là. Et ça, la demande dans cette Chambre va créer un besoin criant pour les traducteurs et interprètes afin de fournir les services. Et ça va aider la formation dans les universités pour éventuellement faire en sorte que ces services pu puissent être offerts à travers le Canada. Et en, à fur et à mesure qu'on progresse, plus en plus de monde va être formé pour offrir les langues euh, autochtones et enseigner. Et ça va donner euh, les chances à les jeunes d'apprendre à, la, à, à la bas âge. Alors, c'est une grande fierté. Merci beaucoup. Reprise de débat, resuming debate, the honorable member for Desnethi, Mississippi, Churchill River. Merci, John. All there is to die. Mr. Speaker, today's is a big day for Indigenous languages in the House of Commons. I'm going to be splitting my comments in half today. First, I'll be speaking in English for the benefit of my colleagues, and afterwards, I'll be making comments in my first language, Dene, which soon I'll be able to speak more freely in these chambers. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, I'm very happy with the findings of the Procedure and House Affairs Committee report on the use of Indigenous languages in the House. I'd like to give a special thank you to the members of the Procedure and House Affairs Committee for the hard work and commitment. Adopting Indigenous languages into House business is no easy task, but because of the members, we are now one step closer to equal recognition. Masicho. As I've said many times, I'm a Dene woman and I grew up on the trap line in northern Saskatchewan. The large majority of people in my writing are Dene or Cree, First Nation and Métis, and many people speak more than one language. The diversity of languages across the writing is awesome yet challenging. I recently had the privilege of attending the First Nations Language Keepers Conference in Saskatoon, hosted by the Saskatchewan Indigenous Cultural Centre. At the conference, I heard from educators like Julia Ouellette, who teaches Cree to youth using physical actions to get the kids moving around while they're learning. I heard from entertainers like Brian Waskewedge, who uses puppets to engage with small kids in Plains Cree using language they'll understand. I also heard from the youth directly, Davis Horse from Thunderchild First Nation, who lives in Cree only household and encourages a traditional lifestyle for youth across Saskatchewan. I also met with Cameron Luzinski, who is developing a smartphone app with his elders to help more young people access the language, his language. If I have one takeaway from my experience at this, this conference, it's that we must provide leadership and act as role models for young Indigenous youth who want to speak their languages. First Nations, Métis, and Inuit languages are thriving across Canada, contrary to popular belief. I'm glad to see that the committee's report agrees that the House should build our capacity to speak our languages. Communicating with our constituents in the languages they speak is so important and adopting this report may seem small, but it will have a significant impact in our communities and in our schools and in our homes. We'll be better able to speak about the issues that matter to them, like education, access to health care, and northern infrastructure. An informed democracy is a strong democracy, and adopting this report is a step in the right direction. Thank you, Masicho, but at this time, 
I'm switching to my first language. Senisa do senika, then in some fina has to a jaw, your choy, the silty. They snap the Mississippi Churchill River and say, the silty. Oh, then he couldn't have a hess, the whole who gale, reserves a lad, nothing ya. Cursina, then in some fina has to the sina, then a sha, so all ya, then in some fina, say a tea, guess near. So quaislu, so pequay. Hamantu haba satayu ni tu hamayu ne. Noha nabi, noha nabi. The shayad zin nuni hi lo hal lesta the shayad na hi jan. Senese se koi sunu du ha sunu thai. Othering du zinik e that igade lt so iniare procedure and house affairs committees report hulila. No haya ti de el ti ha ja dai de hil e la hoin cha de felsila sit e bo haya el ti no need i de c m p northern quebec puts e e liberal hun na de de e a yi de be ya ti a de ke la no horel e ha no haya ti de el ti ha hol la ker sina de ni so sine ha si de si who tells a Saskatchewan a yai, ni ya, he tells us too. Who tells an anastory, senela, sa ho yine, ya ti a yal tila, si dani, dani so clean it as a who, and na, creed a tila, tas a day as tila yi, nant u, dialects, and u, a salta yal ti, senela, for not any yade, e des a hair. A shackled eater eat you, ni zoom, taste it die. Saskatoon Language Keepers Conference Nathia. Saskatchewan Indigenous Cultural Center, Noni Ainla, Saskatoon in Sha Bari. So Ladu no Hodon Les Tanidesta Hon Lesta. Sakwihal Ala Dao. As lafi hal alado, sakwe hal alado, nat unhoya tik rail ni ha. That is the ahuto, phone the boat in to. If this kuna is a dere, lat u sakuhan, sakuhan al khanu, as lafi no hal des u, a kunt u, sene sa kunt u, sa, ho luk a kuna yare, sa, daniya ti, dit ahu, e, dog was arat e, ti a dinner ni ha. Succeed at a conference at the year. But there is neither day dust a sacquil to than a godu to but not be than a day to to dog was already easy, but a day to her. No horrid e. Taste in mercy when a son than a godly con do they ask tea mercy when a son ask nothing no honor be. No how con do they ask tea. Taste is in nature, don't then. Dory la committee. Not u na da ya tiu hores keni so in hores kile and ba ya ti da ya ti real ken holi ya ti a da ya tiu dani hanai isin ho ya ti da ti so in it and a yi kon u hori ke that I don't hear ya e a teh isin nesa mercy ba ya nesan a hu teh and not a day si sa horet in dani ha si sa not a day ha horet in. A sada yal tiu, a sada yal tiu, nont u, teh isin nesa, bai yu, de si dimsk ait i de hilt i, sa em pi de si la, teh i, hori keu, in la no hats a diu, a su hori il zahu, a su hori il zahu, ku du no ni dar, e kamedi, no haya ti, a ba haya is tiu, teh te kundu ba hal hoa is niu, du no horal er e thi si mwersi be in a sense, I do zinik eh, teh in la horin cha holiza, teh il siza. Do do ane, dan isu sini arisim as inohay as tila. I a teh i da mercy bena sense. I a at this time, Mr. Speaker, as I just delivered my presentation, the same similar presentation in Dene, similar. And at this time, what I like to say is from the bottom of my heart. To all Canadians, all Canadians from coast to coast to coast, 
we have this opportunity to acknowledge the Indigenous languages across Canada and the place of government, federal government, and in the House of Commons. We are able to speak in our languages and we are able to showcase the way our first language, in my case, it is Dene. And in my writing, I have Cree, three dialects, the Métis, the Mechif, and other Indigenous languages. It is a very significant step in the right direction. We are beginning to build bridges and reconciliation is beginning to occur. So from the bottom of my heart, I want to thank all my committee, friends, and the committee, and all members of the parliament, and government officials who helped make this happen. And you too, Mr. Speaker, you helped make it happen. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. Merci, Cho. Siniesa. Questions and comments? Questions and commentaires? Honorable Deputy de Laurenti de Labelle. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I sincerely hope that today is the last day we have to hear Indigenous speeches in this House without the use of translation. The opportunities are there in this report that should the member next time wish to speak in this way, should be able to inform the, the table and have those interpreters ready to interpret us. It's a very sad statement in here when we're listening to a speech and watching the interpreters both go silent. I would have loved to have heard everything she said in real time. So this is more of a comment than a question, but I very much appreciate her pushing us to do this, be participating in the study and demonstrating the importance of it and the need for it here in the House today. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Desnate, Mississippi, Churchill River. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you for my colleague, the question across the way. I actually said at the beginning of my presentation, I was able to deliver my first version of my presentation in English. And what I did do when I spoke in Dene as what is written, and unfortunately, the way our translation in Dene doesn't go word for word. And if I went word for word, it would be really confusing to even for me to speak and try to communicate. So on my thinking of the ability to think in Dene and the ability to think in English, to my best of the ability, I tried to take the issue where the translators won't be able to translate today. But from this day forward, we can make that request and translators will be made available and then you can be able to hear that. So thank you. Questions and comments? Questions and commentaires? Le député de Chalaga. Merci, M. le Président. Je remarquais ma collègue quand elle faisait son discours dans sa langue à elle que sa gestuelle était différente. Donc, la langue, c'est intimement relié à la personnalité de quelqu'un, à la culture de quelqu'un. D'ailleurs, j'ai euh, étudié en anthropologie et une chose qu'on dit quand on va étudier un peuple qu'on ne connaît pas, ce qu'on étudie en premier, c'est le vocabulaire. Parce que le vocabulaire et ça, ça nous montre la, le monde de cette personne-là. Donc, c'est vraiment une réflexion du monde de la personne. Un exemple, en ineptitude, il y a tellement de mots pour la neige parce qu'ils vivent dans un monde de neige, souvent. Euh, moi, j'ai seulement quelques mots pour la neige. Alors, si on veut pouvoir conserver les cultures autochtones, de garder les langues autochtones, c'est un début. Alors, j'aimerais avoir l'opinion de ma collègue sur ça. L'honorable député de Disney, Mississippi, Churchill River. I'm extremely fascinated by languages. When I hear Dene people speak in their languages, when we speak our languages, we have a lot of sense of humor and we laugh lots. And when we speak in English, we have a tendency to be a little more serious because we're worried about, oh, did I make a mistake in saying this English word? I'm so concerned about the way I'm speaking English. But when I'm comfortable, then in some China, I yes, today, when I speak in Dene, so D had the rest there. Land U Dene, I think I hear you, Land U Benik Alan Neu, Land U Balde El Tiha. So what we do is we look at translating how to soften the tone so that we can engage and have a little uh, humor attached to it so that 
everybody can feel comfortable in communicating with one another. When I was in Saskatoon, I heard from Cree speaking Nakota, Dene, and the other two languages in Saskatchewan. It was fascinating to hear young people speaking in Cree, Nakota, and their languages because they're able to communicate in their first language. So I am very fascinated by languages and the way we translate and how to make that happen and how we can grow more in Canada. Thank you. Resuming debate, the Honourable Member for Portage Lisker. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to speak today to the Procedural and House Affairs Committee's 66th report on the use of Indigenous languages in House proceedings. I will be sharing my time with uh, the Honourable Member for Lanark, Frontenac, Kingston. Um, it, it's been very good to hear uh, my colleagues from uh, both sides of the House speak to this already. Very uh, interesting. For myself personally, I, I, I'm, I'm very uh, inspired and uh, encouraged by what I hear. Uh, my speech may be a little bit different, but I'm, I think it's wonderful that we can each bring our perspective. My granddaughter, um, her, her father is my son, so her father is of Mennonite descent, but her mother, my granddaughter's mother, is Anishinaabe. And so I, I'm just so pleased to be able to uh, share that heritage and, uh, and so many wonderful things with my granddaughter. I also was fortunate to have lived at Grand Rapids, uh, Manitoba, for a number of years. And so um, I learned, actually, at that time, some wonderful church hymns in the Cree language. I won't be sharing those today, but it was just a wonderful language and wonderful to be able to, to learn and share that language. Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the report we're discussing today calls upon us to decide on an appropriate balance between the use of indig Indigenous languages in House proceedings and the ability of all members to comprehend those interventions. In principle, simultaneous interpretation for all Indigenous language sounds and is a well-intentioned aspirational concept. Uh, but I think it is important that we are fully alert to many um, of the consequences, good, good consequences, good uh, effects, but also maybe some unintended consequences that could come out, out of that. I worry that unintended consequences will follow if we adopt the committee's report specifically as written. For starters, uh, let me just explain why. There are a dozen languages other than French and English spoken in Canada by more Canadians than all Indigenous languages combined, namely Spanish, Mandarin, Cantonese, Punjabi, Arabic, Tagalog, Italian, German, Hindi, Urdu, Portuguese, and Russian. If we were to treat each Indigenous language, and there are actually more, of six, more than 60 of them, separately, I could add yet another dozen languages that are more commonly spoken in Canada than Cree, the most common Indigenous language. As a result, we may find ourselves as members with new demands from constituents from among these 24 linguistic communities or others to speak for them in their language in this House. Today I can say that Canada's official languages are spoken and readily understood in the Parliament, with a small indulgence for modest uses of other languages which members speak in this place from time to time. But if interpretation facilities are in place for non-official languages, over time, we as parliamentarians may be harder pressed to explain why interpretation is not also provided for other languages spoken in the House of Commons that may represent a large number of Canadians. Another concern, Mr. Speaker, on the law of unintended consequences concerning the recommendations to arrange for interpreters is that Canada simply doesn't have a lot of people right now at the ready who can come and interpret speeches for us. According to the 2016 census, some 400 Canadians with a knowledge of, the, of Indigenous languages work in the interpretation and translation field. Considering that translators and interpreters do very different work, the Translation Bureau has an inventory of just 115 Indigenous language interpreters on file. I understand, Mr. Speaker, that only three of them live in or are close to Ottawa. The rest live and work in communities across Canada and often at quite a distance from Ottawa. Consider uh, that an interpreter's time would definitely be required. Though we might be asking someone to come here to interpret a 10-minute speech, we may be asking them to dedicate two or more days to a single assignment, uh, one that you would consider that once you consider the travel required. 
That's time away from providing important and necessary support in their home communities, support which is crucial to many Canadians' interactions with medical, government, and legal services. And I'm thinking back to my time living in Grand Rapids, a very um, uh, isolated community where these services uh, could be very much used. Now, to satisfy this report, truthfully, to satisfy a few of us politicians here in Ottawa, who I'm not saying should be disregarded, but I, I think that the needs of Canadians and Indigenous uh, Canadians across the country should be put, be put before our needs. But in order to satisfy our requests, we would be asking what few interpreters there are to abandon their clients for days at a time. We run, run a serious risk of throwing into disarray those important services potentially endangering many Canadians. That's a significant and a legitimate concern, and it's one which I hope that we haven't overlooked. Another concern is that despite the available pool of interpreters, most of them are simply not experienced interpreting to and from French, which is another part of this. That would prompt the need for some of us to turn what's called relay interpretation. So let me explain. If we have someone speaking Cree, which would be interpreted into English, then that English interpretation would need to be uh, rendered into French. So if you think of the expression lost in translation, which is a real thing, that's likely what we could see happen with the use of this relay interpretation. Compounding this is subsection 4.3 of the Official Languages Act, which requires our debates to be recorded in one of the official languages and to be accompanied by a translation in the other official language. In fact, this could be unconstitutional. Subsection 16.1 of the Charter provides that, and I quote, English and French are the official languages of Canada and have equality of status and equal rights and privileges as to their use in all institutions of the Parliament and Government of Canada." End quote. So equality of status and equality rights, and equal rights, Mr. Speaker. Relay, relay interpretation might not honour those constitutional uh, guarantees. These are issues are a matter of concern that earlier this year in other places, when a report of the Senate's Internal Economy Committee presented the views of its, of its advisory working group on parliamentary translation services. And I'm going to quote from that uh, report. The lack of high-quality translation and interpreta interpretation services for the Senate also affects the rights of Canadians. The Senate has a constitutional duty to make services of equal quality available to the public in both official languages. Words matter. The Senate must do what it can to ensure that no matter what language is originally used, its publications and broadcasts reflect the very best translation and interpretation available so that all Canadians have equal access to the entire context of the debate and to its nuance." End quote. So if the equality of Canada's official languages is genuinely important to us, these unintended consequences and, and more should offer all of us pause. Of course, Matt, Mr. Speaker, we're not talking here about the right to use Indigenous languages. How much time do I have left? Two minutes. Uh, in this House. We're firm believers in the freedom of speech. The right uh, for a member to speak uh, in the chamber on behalf of their constituents is paramount. Speech goes to the purpose of this institution, and its name is Parliament. Now, I'm going to actually just go. I, I think that, that Madam, Mr. Speaker, a very workable plan has been laid out, and I'm going to quote uh, the Speaker. It's, he says, if members want to ensure that the comments they make in a language other than French or English can be understood by those who are following the proceedings and are part of the official record in the debates, an extra step is required. Specifically, members need to repeat their comments and run one of the two official languages so that our interpreters can provide the appropriate interpretation and so that they can be fully captured in the debates." End quote. So I think that this is a sensible and balanced approach which minimizes consequences while honouring the equality of official languages. This approach uh, is done in the Legislative Assembly of the Northern Territories. Uh, an Australian jurisdiction where close to 20% of the population uses daily at least one of the territory's 100-plus Aboriginal languages. And closer to home here in the Yukon, the territorial legislation allows for the use of English, French, and what are called Yukon Aboriginal languages, but there are no interpretation facilities. So I'm um, getting close to my end of time. Um, I, I, I guess I would just wrap up by saying that 
we do believe that resources like this would be better used to help and support Indigenous people, to promote and support Indigenous languages, and not use, although it might be um, as somewhat self-indulgent, I would say, I understand the spirit of this report, I think we all support the spirit of this report, but I think that there are more efficient ways that we can accomplish uh, the goals than what has been laid out in the report. Thank you very much. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for uh, Winnipeg Centre. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, it's actually my belief that parliamentarians have a constitutional protected right to use an Indigenous language in Parliament. Subsections 35.1 of the Constitution Act 1982 states that the existing Aboriginal treaty rights of the Aboriginal peoples of Canada are hereby are recognized and affirmed. And do languages actually fall within these provisions? Uh, Professor Karen Drake has written about Indigenous language rights in Canada as pre-existing the Canadian state, and these rights have not been extinguished and are still present. Um, others like David Leach and Lorena Fontaine have been working towards launching a constitutional challenging, arguing that under subsection 35.1, the federal government has not only a negative obligation not to stifle Aboriginal languages, but a positive obligation to provide the resources necessary to the revitalization of those languages. So there are many sub-steps and different ideas that uh, relate to this, especially within a decision of Vanderpreet. In order for an Aboriginal right or an activity must be an element of practice, custom or tradition integral to the distinctive culture of the Aboriginal group claiming the right. And I believe that Indigenous languages actually meet that constitutional uh, requirement. Now, uh, you know, it's a very interesting argument about concerning French and English. But I think these are, the, in fact, the original languages of this land. I think they actually deserve uh, just as much respect. Now, I understand that there are many speakers who speak other languages who have come from around the world to the Canadian state. Uh, but as if we look to, for instance, to other parliaments, New South Wales in Australia, because it was mentioned Australia by the uh, honorable member, um, uh, New South Wales has introduced Aboriginal language legislation to ensure that the protection uh, of these indigenous languages in New South Wales, but also that their ability to be heard within the chamber and of providing of services related uh, to these languages. One member for Portage Lisker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I thank my honourable colleague uh, for his comments. And I, I think we're actually in full agreement here. I, I agree that uh, there, there, no one's right here to speak sh should ever be stopped. You, we all have a right to speak and to reflect our constituents' wishes as well as our own thoughts. But we also have a, all have a right to understand what's being spoken. And I think what we're trying to do is find what's the best way to do that so that what I say in whatever language I choose can then be understood by each one of my honourable colleagues who have been here duly elected by their constituents. And I think what we're really aiming to do is find that solution. Uh, this PROC report was um, come to in a real spirit of, 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 uh, of unity. It, I think it was done very well, and I think that's what we're looking at. Even though there may be parts of the uh, report that we don't necessarily agree with, we agree with the spirit of it, and that is that members should be allowed to speak and members should be allowed to and be able to understand what's being spoken. So I think that we definitely are all on the same page and that we can find a solution. Questions and comments? Questions and commentaires? The Honourable Member for Desnete, Ms. Nippy, Churchill River. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. What I'd like to do at this time, I would like to ask a question. First, I'd like to make a comment and a question. I'm going to do it in English, and then I want to translate it in Dene so that my constituents who speak then they can hear what I'm saying. What the comments I heard just now from the Conservative Party, the strength of colonialism, the strength of dismissing and destroying Indigenous languages, they promote that. And as an Indigenous woman, a Dene-speaking woman, my ancestors were born here first in where my homeland is. And they want me to dismiss that so that they want me to cater to them. I think of all the youth and all the elders before me, before me and behind me. Today is the most significant day in moving forward. 
but one party remains to promote colonialism, and that breaks my heart. Now, having said that, as a Dene woman born in Saskatchewan, northern Saskatchewan, grew up on the trap line, I spoke Dene first language, and we are still promoting that. I have a constitutional right to speak in Dene because my ancestors were here first. Who did I conservative party do? Constitutional right there, it is no green chow, no horrid e. A big ill neha, no need e. No haya tea, did a hot a no need in a horrid a hot a no need is it a little a. So now, what I'm asking, why is she denying the argument about the ability to speak? The, English, the Dene language or Cree or another, another language of indigenous culture language, why are they denying our right? The Honourable Member for Portage Lisker in 45 seconds or less, please. That was 45 seconds. Well, I guess some of us are more equal than others. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Really? Speaker, you know, I, I very much, um, I'm very, very insulted by what uh, I was just accused of. Uh, I'm going to choose to take the high road. I want us all in this house to be able to speak the language that we choose, and then if we would like it to be understood by everyone, then speak it in either English or French so that it could be translated. And I sometimes think the easy way, instead of proposing a legitimate counter-argument, the easy thing to do is call names. And uh, I find that very, very saddening and disrespectful to this place. And I think we can continue this discussion, find a very positive solution that will honour all Canadians from every background, every ling linguistic background, our first Canadians, can new Canadians. That's our heart's desire and that's the spirit of what this report was given. Thank you. Resuming debate, reprise du débat, the Honourable Member for Lanark, Frontenac, Kingston. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, and I thank my colleague from Portage Lisker for generously giving me the opportunity to speak on this subject uh, uh, and half her time. I, um, I was a member of the Procedure and House Affairs Committee that dealt with this issue. And I, I just want to be clear to the House. I have some prepared remarks, but I'm going to de depart from them for the first part of my, my comments because. It appears to me that a narrative has already been started, that the Procedure and House Affairs Committee uh, proposed a system under which Indigenous languages would be treated as being equal in debates in this place to uh, French and English. Nothing could be further from the truth. And uh, just to point out just how great the restrictions that are placed upon Indigenous languages by the Procedure and House Affairs Committee. Uh, I'm going to actually read from its report, its recommendations. So there are only two recommendations. The first one is, the second deals, by the way, with expenses associated with being a, 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 a user of Indigenous language. The first one, and the one that's being discussed here so far, is this. That the use of Indigenous languages be recognized in the House of Commons according to the process set out in this report on page 2526. Let me now read what that says. The committee recommends that members who wish to use an Indigenous language be required to give reasonable notice in writing to the Clerk of the House of Commons of their intention to speak in an Indigenous language during a future sitting of the House or Committee meeting. In practice, this notice of requirement would, or sorry, notice requirement would be similar to that which exists in the Senate of Canada. In the Senate, reasonable notice is not defined. Instead, the intention of the term reasonable is to provide for flexibility in finding uh, available and qualified simultaneous interpreters. 
in the case of the House, prospectively, reasonable notice for Indigenous language use would include the time required to obtain interpretation services and make technical arrangements. In addition, the committee acknowledges that the technical requirements for the use of the Indigenous languages in the chamber differ from those in House committees, where it would be yet more complicated. So, to be clear about this, uh, if you want to speak Indigenous language under that, in the House of Commons, under the proposals made by the PROC committee, you are going to have to give substantial uh, advance notice because time will be required to contact a translator, have that translator come to the House of Commons, have that translator provide the, uh, the translation. If it's a committee, you have to set up a separate translation booth because there is an inadequate uh, uh, facilities for uh, use of a third language or the relay language process in our committee rooms right now. We know this because the PROC committee itself had to go through this process and it could not be done expeditiously. So all of this is by way of saying that if anybody thinks that the Procedure and House Affairs Committee proposed a utopia in which people would stand up and speak uh, an Indigenous language with the same facility and immediate translation that is going on right now between French and English, uh, they are sadly mistaken. And so if anybody criticizes my colleague and House Leader for suggesting that we need to deal in a practical way with the situations which will arise all the time where someone wants to stand up and speak extemporaneously or on a debate that has arisen on short notice, something where we can't bring in a translator from wherever that uh, language is spoken in the country, uh, then using a system like the one my colleague suggested, and the speaker suggested this first, is the way to deal with this. The person who is speaking the Indigenous language is speaks in the Indigenous language, and then provides the translation into French or English. There is no other way we can think of. And we racked our imaginations trying to think of other ways of doing it. There is no other practical way of allowing spontaneous participation to occur in this place. So when a set piece is coming up, that's great. You can move to what the Procedure House Affairs Committee suggested. But what my colleague suggested, what the speaker suggested about Facilitating this is a reasonable solution, and it is reasonable for the speaker to do, Mr. Speaker, as you did today, when a person is using Indigenous language, to show some flexibility on the time so they can express themselves in both of those languages, whether they use the Indigenous language first, or as today, they speak in English or French and then go to the Indigenous language. That's all my colleague was suggesting. That is a reasonable approach. There is no reason to attack my, my colleague who has the best of intentions, who cares so deeply, who has, my goodness, uh, a family that includes people who are uh, speakers of Indigenous language. You know, to say that this is some kind of colonial mindedness is just wrong. It's just wrong. The fact is that there is tolerance, openness throughout Canadian society, regardless of partisan divide, and turning these issues into partisan issues. When we had a, a report that was uh, participated in by all members of the House with good intentions is just inappropriate, Mr. Speaker, just inappropriate. Now, I had some remarks, prepared remarks. Let me turn to that. I was, of course, uh, we are, of course, discussing the 66th report of the Procedure House Affairs Committee, um, and I wanted to discuss some significant facts here, some significant practical facts. Um, as you may know, as no doubt you are aware, I wrote a book on Canada's official languages some 25 years ago. Uh, it came out, in fact, in uh, December of 1993. Here we are, 25th anniversary uh, since that was done. Um, and I did have a bit of interest at the time, uh, and was therefore eager to uh, add to my knowledge of, of Canada's Indigenous languages when we had these, uh, these hearings. Um, one of the things that is clear is that while we can talk about Indigenous languages as a single group or single concept, the reality is that there are some Indigenous languages which are spoken by a significant number of people, enough that they are not considered uh, by um, linguistics experts to be in danger of, of extinction in the short run. Uh, six uh, of our 60 Indigenous languages fit into this category. They are the Cree languages, Dene, Inu, Inuktitut, Ojibwe, and Oji Cree. And of those, Inuktitut is the standout. Its numbers are actually uh, growing um, in part because of the large birth rate in part of, of uh, up in Nunavut and in part because of, um, of the fact that the environment uh, 
being far away from English and French language centers has to some degree provided a natural layer of protection uh, that uh, uh, was not afforded to other languages. Uh, other remaining languages, although they are equally precious, to be clear, are in much greater danger, and there are practical difficulties associated with finding uh, translators for some of those. On the other hand, the likelihood of having um, a, uh, a speaker of, of one of the less widely spoken languages in the Commons is considerably less than, for example, the virtually 100% chance that we will always have an Inuktitut speaker in the House of Commons. Um, I just want to uh, point out, if I could, I want to point out, maybe I'll go directly to is, is you know, a point about how seriously my party, because we've been attacked today, how seriously my party takes um, language rights in Canada. I'm going to make this point by turning to um, official language use. It's history in Canada. Um, you know, the official languages, the use of languages in our parliamentary facilities, institutions, has been an, an issue in Canada since 1791 when the Constitutional Act was packed. And in 1793, January 1793, there was a debate in the uh, Legislative Assembly of Lower Canada in which uh, French was adopted as one of the official languages of that institution. With the BNA Act, in, uh, or Constitution Act, as it's now called, of 1867, uh, Jean Chrétien Cartier and Sir Johnny MacDonald ensured that both French and English would be uh, languages of this institution. Uh, the Translation Bureau of the federal government was set in place under the government of uh, R.B. Bennett, a conservative prime minister. Uh, the uh, Translation Bureau Act remains in effect to this day. It was enacted in 1934. In 1958, uh, George, John George Diefenbaker uh, brought in simultaneous translation in this place. Before that, when a member spoke in French, unilingual English members had no idea what that person was saying, and the reverse, 1958. Um, and that was opposed by many members, including many liberal members, but it was the right thing to do. Uh, similarly, um, the most recent version of the Official Languages Act was passed by the uh, government uh, of Brian Mulroney. And on the issue of Indigenous participation, I just want to point out that uh, everybody knows, of course, that Indigenous Canadians were deprived of the right to vote. They were given that right in 1960 by Diefenbaker's government. There had been an earlier attempt in 1885 under Sir Johnny Macdonald's government to introduce something called the Electoral Franchise Act that would have given uh, Indigenous Canadians the right to vote. That was opposed by parliamentary liberals at the time, and in 1898, that right was taken away. In short, Mr. Speaker, there are no parties here who can say we've all been angels throughout our history on this subject. But on this subject right now, of trying to do what we all can to assist Indigenous Canadians in being full participants in every aspect of Canadian life, including debates here, I say that all parties stand on morally equal ground. We merely disagree on the practicalities of how best to achieve that common goal. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And comments. Question and comment. I have the honourable member for Winnipeg Centre. I'd like to uh, thank the honourable member for his speech. I think uh, when we saw the report, I was very moved by it, and I accept uh, that every party was putting forward, you know, their um, full desire to, in a good way, to build the Canada that we all deserve in this nation. And I thank the honourable member for his hard work. I remember being at the committee as a witness and having him ask me questions. Um, there is a certain practical nature to this, and we're starting something. This is not utopia, as, as was mentioned. You know, we have to, there are practical issues that need to be uh, delved into as we move forward. You know, you do have to give two days' notice or reasonable notice, and I understand uh, that that is something, you know, as we move forward, you know, is an interpreter available? You know, there can't be a point of privilege, obviously, if there's not an interpreter available. You know, we can't waste the time of the House, but as time moves forward, as these services develop, as perhaps there are more members who are elected who desire to speak an Indigenous language, uh, some of the more common ones, then I suspect uh, that we come, uh, was become more accustomed to how we go about and we come up with procedures that work in this place and, uh, and customs that become unto our own, uh, that it will become easier and easier to offer, offer Indigenous languages. But this is truly a day to start, and I think in, in my heart is it a day to celebrate and to rejoice of the work that we have done in common cause. The Honourable Member for Lanark Frontenac, Kingston. Thank you. I, I just want to take an advantage. That was more of a comment than a question. So 
I wonder if I could take the advantage of um, just developing that the, the theme of the Honourable Member expressed uh, as follows. Um, there are, of course, widely spoken Indigenous languages in Canada, Cree, OG Cree, Inuktitut, uh, and, and several others, the, we could call the big six that have over 10,000 speakers each. Uh, there are also many languages with fewer speakers. I don't think there should be, in principle, a distinction between the two. One is not more valuable than the other. It's simply a statistical likelihood that we will have certain individuals here. There are also practical difficulties that get greater and greater, however, in terms of getting a suitable translator for some of the less widely spoken languages. On the other hand, uh, no one just shows up and uh, in the middle of a parliament becomes a member unless it's a by-election, which means we have some warning as to who the speakers are. Second point I want to make in this regard, Mr. Speaker, is I think the issue is the language of use, not the uh, whether or not the speaker is him or herself Indigenous. Uh, it seems reasonable to me that if one were to have, for example, a non-Indigenous person representing an area with an Indigenous population and uh, they were trying to give a set-piece speech that we ought to try and accommodate it, and if they were doing so in a manner that was off the cuff, that they would be expected to uh, provide some kind of translation. That se just seems reasonable uh, to me. This is all about equality. Questions and comments? Questions and commentaires? The Honourable Member for Skeena, Bulkley Valley. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I, I'm going to direct my question to my friend, who I've known for some time, uh, and he and I share, I think, a, a significant amount of respect for each other, and I, I hope that's true from his perspective as well. And I, and I want to uh, say to him, I, I do represent uh, riding northwestern British Columbia, Skeena Bulkley Valley, of which 35, 40 percent of the people living there represent our Indigenous Canadians from many, many groups, the Simshian, the Haida, the Wet'suwet'en, the Gitsan, and on. And I want to talk to him about um, privilege, which is a word that we sometimes thrust upon uh, those who are uh, of wealthy or born to high status that he and I enjoy uh, an equal privilege of being non-Indigenous and being English speakers of our native tongue. That when we move through the world, we are able to enjoy a world here in Canada, certainly in Parliament and around the country in which our language is very often understood. That puts us at ease because we can fully express ourselves, our questions, our concerns, and yet there are many who do not have that pri privilege, particularly Indigenous Canadians. And that we must understand that the, this country of ours cannot be its complete self until there is some effort to reconcile what was imposed upon Indigenous peoples, and in particular, the issue of language. Because the inability to express oneself in our native tongue, as the expression is, limits our ability to be effective in the world, diminishes our power in the world. And that I would think that getting over these technical challenges to allow the people's house to finally reconcile this imposition of a colonial structure upon Indigenous peoples would be something that all of us would welcome, rather than find reasons to resist. Does he understand this notion, and do he understand the importance of this, not just to people here, but more importantly, to many millions of Canadians across this country? Honourable Member for Lennox, Frontenac, Kingston. Forgive me, Mr. Speaker, how long do I have to respond? About 45 seconds. Well, I, I guess I could respond in, in one second by just saying yes. Uh, in answer to that question. But maybe, uh, if I can, I'd just like to make the, the point uh, to my, my colleague. I, I'm afraid we don't have time for me to ask him a question. I would ask you know, um, the status of the, the, the languages in terms of whether they are, are endangered or robust. I actually am just unfamiliar with the details in his, uh, his writing with regard to those languages. But look, all of these languages are as important to those who speak them, those who are born in them, those who can most fully express themselves as, uh, as the more widely spoken languages. That goes without saying. He's right, they, they, combine, they, they bring no particular economic advantage, but they are as rich in terms of the literature they bring with them, the heritage, the history. And you know, once you're a part of a culture, it's not something you can just say, I'll, I'll rewrite the record to put myself in a, a more advantageous position. And who could not have sympathy with such a situation? Who could not say we should do all that we can but all that we can has to be dictated by what we practically can do. That's the only caveat I'd put on something I agree 100 percent with the, the perspective that my honourable colleague, who I respect very much, is expressing. Thank you. Reprise du débat, resuming debate, l'honorable député de Laurentide Labelle. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I will be sharing my time. It gives me particular pride to rise on Report 66 from the Standing Committee on Procedure and House Affairs and the importance of adopting this report on time for its recommendations to be in place.
place for our imminent move to West Brock. Growing up, I was taught, as all Canadians have been, at least since the Official Languages Act was brought in, that Canada has two official languages, representing the two foundational nations of the country we call Canada. Canada, of course, you were taught was an Indian word meaning home. I say Indian deliberately and without an accurate translation of Canada in this context because that is how we were taught. It, it was something that never made a lot of sense, and as a kid I accepted the facts as they were presented to me. But I always had a twinge of a doubt. Somehow, the English and the French, two Western European powers, had founded Canada. But I asked myself questions as a kid. Why was there an Indian reserve called Doncaster Number 17 almost walking distance from my house? What was being reserved? What did the Indians call it? What were these Indians we had been taught ever so vaguely about, if not foundational, to Canada? If there was a word Canada, what was the rest of their language? If I lived in Canada, why did I not speak Canadian? England speaks English, France speaks French, Korea speaks Korean, Japan speaks Japanese, and I didn't know anything about African languages, because quite frankly, we still aren't really taught about how that continent got its borders and countries, or how incredibly vast Africa actually is. We were not taught anything about its numerous languages, and having that knowledge would probably only have further conf uh, confused my childhood self in my quest for understanding the missing nations here in Canada, because we were never really taught about colonialism either. My father, Joseph, who has since become very learned in indigenous issues and the real history, that is, not what we were taught in school, but what actually happened, told me as a child that his grandfather, Alphonse Paré, a mining engineer and later Canadian cavalry officer in the First World War, spoke four Canadian languages, French, English, Cree, and Ojibwe. They were, my father told me, the trading languages of his day. And acting in his capacity as a mining engineer in Timmins, itself a city named for him for his, by him for his uncle Noah Timmins, he did quite a bit of trading in northern Ontario. But he felt no need, no obligation, to pass his additional languages onto his nine children for reasons I will never know. Just to confuse matters, Alphonse's wife, my Welsh great-grandmother Lucy Griffith, was born in Australia, and their middle daughter, ski champion Patricia de Berg, Pat Parry, my grandmother, was born in Ireland, while her father fought on the front lines in France, directly resulting in my own middle name of de Berg. At the same time, I learned that on my mother's, Sheila's side, my Istanbul-born grandfather, Expo 67 engineer Benno Eskenazi, spoke Ladino, for which he edited the Sephardic Folk Dictionary in the 1990s, precisely in order to preserve that dying language, as well as Turkish, Greek, French, and English. My grandmother, Goldie Wolofsky, spoke Yiddish, English, and French. Her own grandfather, Hirsch Wolofsky, was the publisher of their Canada Adler, Canada's first daily Yiddish newspaper. Often I could hear my grandparents speak to each other in Spanish and Ladino, similar enough languages to be able to communicate, but both languages I did not understand. Incidentally, my grandmother and my mother, both born and raised in Montreal, were not permitted to attend French school as they were Jewish. These languages were not passed on to me, and I wondered why. In high school, I took German classes specifically to be able to understand Yiddish, a language related to German in the way Ladino is related to Spanish. Unfortunately, I never found anyone to practice even German with, let alone someone to convert this knowledge to Yiddish. And so, to this day, I speak neither German nor Yiddish, though I can exchange a few basic sentences in the former. While three generations ago, Yiddish was the third most spoken language in Montreal after French and English, its speakers today are small in number. Part of my own culture, part of my background, has been largely lost. My wife, Michelle, is from Mindanao, an island fraught with civil war in the southern Philippines. Her hometown of Isulan has faced two fatal bombings this summer alone. She speaks Hiligaynon, Cebuano, Aklanon, Tagalog, and English. The Philippines were occupied by the Spanish starting in the early 16th century. The country is, is itself named for the reigning Spanish king at the time, King Philip II. In the nearly seven years since we met for the first time at the flame in front of Parliament Hill, I have wanted to learn about her culture, their culture, prior to the arrival of the Spanish. In my efforts, I have found precious little information. And while there are over 40 languages spoken today across the Philippines, most are heavily influenced by both the Spanish occupation and the subsequent American influence following their takeover of the territory at the end of the 19th century with the 1898 Treaty of Paris. Knowing the cultures that built who we are, who our ancestors are, or who our children are, is not something to be taken lightly. We are each the product of where our ancestors, ancestors have been, who they were, and what they have done. Many in this place have met my daughter, Ozara, as among her many visits to the Hill, she has been here, been here for Halloween dressed as a parliamentary page, the Speaker of the House, and most recently a commercial rated pilot. Not bad for a four-year-old kid, one who I hope will grow up knowing two things. First, that there is nothing in the world that she cannot do if she chooses to. And second, where she comes from through as many generations as we can discover. When she turned one, we tried to figure out how many languages the grandparents of her grandparents are known to have spoken. And it is very likely that there are at least some languages spoken by them that we are not aware of. Down the Paré line, Ozara is a 14th generation Quebecer, but she comes from many lines, from many countries. 
We know for sure that between us, we have ancestors at minimum from Australia, Canada, Ireland, France, Scotland, Spain, Poland, Ukraine, Russia, Turkey, the Philippines, and Wales, which is incidentally the same size as my writing. Over just the past three generations, her direct ancestors spoke at minimum Aklanon, Cebuano, Cree, English, French, Greek, Hebrew, Hiligaynon, Tinaraya, Ladino, Magundanao, Baranao, Ojibwe, Polish, Russian, Spanish, Tagalog, Turkish, and Yiddish. Of those 19 languages, her parents, Michelle and I, speak six, having lost 13 others along the way. And English is the only language we have in common. In my family, we have lost an average of about four languages per generation. All of this to say that my clarity on the whole issue of our true original languages was lacking well into my adult life. And to say I fully understand it now would be a bit of a stretch. On June 8, 2017, my friend and colleague from Winnipeg Centre rose on a question of privilege because he had intended to speak his own cultural language, Cree, in this place and wished to be understood. The speaker's ruling two weeks later on the topic said this is not a question of privilege under current procedures and practices, but three months later wrote a letter to PROC suggesting we take a closer look at the matter. As a member of PROC since my arrival in this place, I said to myself, damn right I want to look at this topic. Who am I to tell people from this land that they, not, that they cannot speak the languages of this land in Parliament of all places? We often mention that we are not on, on, that we are on unceded Anishinaabek lands, but we do not talk about ignoring unceded languages or dis disregarding unceded cultures. They are unceded in the same way. They were given, they were not, they, they were not given, they were taken away. Now, to be clear, any MP can speak any language they want, any time they want in this place. There's plenty of precedent and procedure and practice even addresses the issue directly. The real practical issue is to be understood. In the records, Hansard will simply say, the member spoke in language X, and if provided, include a translation after the fact. Recently, the member from Ville Marie, the Sud-West Ile rose in this house and gave an entire statement in the Mohawk language, one of several indigenous languages used as unbroken code throughout the Second World War. He said, on this day, the 8th of November, we will all bring our minds together and pay our respects to the indigenous peoples who enlisted in the Canadian Armed Forces. Let us think of them and let us remember those who fought and died in the Great Wars. Let us pay our respects and let us honour those who died for us so that we could live in peace. Let our minds be that way. Let us remember them. I can think of no greater irony or demonstration of our failure in this regard than that a statement by a Caucasian delivered in this place in Mohawk, thanking Indigenous soldiers for their service to defend our democracy, may only be understood a day later through a written submission, as even with the text provided, our interpreters could not tell us what was being said in a very Canadian language. These, re these languages deserve to be understood in the House, and Report 66 lays out a path to start getting us there. I probably have some small amount of Indigenous blood myself. My family being documented in Quebec since 1647, it is quite likely. The fact that I do not know for sure speaks volumes about the importance we have placed in documenting such information. It is not this possibility that motivates me. It is the fact that so many Canadians and so many people in colonized countries all over the world do not know where they are from and as a result who they truly are. I know that I am the product of an enormous number of languages and cultures from all over the world that I know little to nothing about and I personally regret that. It is not right for us to not to do everything we can to preserve cultures important to the people who come from them and languages important to the people who use them. It is doubly not right to include languages foundational to our country in the one place that is supposed to represent everyone and everything about us. We have the option here today to adopt PROC Report 66, which gives us a roadmap, a plan, a beginning to start to think about solving these issues here in the House, to offer Indigenous language speaking members the opportunity to both speak and be understood in this place. We are generations late in doing so, but with the move to West Block and the technological changes already in place in that building, it is time to act, to not delay any further. And for members who don't agree, I encourage them to take it up with their caucus, itself not a Latin word, but rather an unceded word from the Algonquin languages. Mr. Speaker, it is not my intention to allow my daughter to grow up not knowing this history, not recognizing that this country we call Canada, as we know it, was built on top of unceded Indigenous lands, unceded Indigenous cultures, and unceded Indigenous languages. It is said that in North American Indigenous cultures, one's value is measured not by what you have, but by what you give. On that basis, these cultures and the people who represent them have infinite value, for they have given everything. We must adopt Report 66, and you must do it today. Some things can wait no longer. And in case you're wondering, Mr. Speaker, the Mohawk called Doncaster Reserve Number 17, Jorodon, meaning roughly, where the wind begins. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Questions and comments? Questions and commentaires? L'honorable député de Sherbrooke. Merci, euh, merci, M. le Président, et je remercie mon collègue pour son intervention dans ce, cet important débat. Et j'ai l'impression, à voir le, 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 le débat d'aujourd'hui, qu'un euh, jour assez proche, euh, on va pouvoir avoir une traduction simultanée 
pour euh, des députés qui souhaitent s'exprimer dans, dans leur langue, euh, euh, dans leur langue de, de leur naissance, sans toute fin pratique. Euh, et je me demandais s'il pensait que ben, cette, ce pas dans la bonne direction ce serait aussi un pas qui encouragerait plus de députés euh, provenant d'endroits de, 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 euh, et de euh, milieux autochtones. Euh, ça les encouragerait à se présenter euh, en politique puis venir en cette chambre en sachant que, en étant ici, ils allaient pouvoir, ils allaient, ils allaient pouvoir s'exprimer dans leur langue euh, de naissance, leur langue maternelle. Euh, et être compris, bien sûr, par tous les députés au même moment où ils, ils, donnent ce, ils livrent un discours dans leur langue maternelle. Donc, est-ce qu'ils pensent qu'une telle, une telle avancée permettrait d'encourager plus de députés euh, qui ont des langues autochtones comme langue maternelle à se présenter pour être députés en cette Chambre? Honorable député de Laurentier de la Belle. Absolument, j'espère que c'est le cas. En tout cas, on ne peut pas dire absolument, on verra qu'est-ce qui se passe. Mais en sachant, en se présentant que tu pourrais parler la langue que tu parles chez toi, ou que tes ancêtres ont parlé et que tu n'as pas appris, mais tu as pris la peine d'apprendre, ça peut juste être bon pour la représentation autochtone qui est massivement sous-représentée dans la Chambre ici. Donc, ce que le, mon collègue de Sherbrooke dit, c'est absolument correct. C'est important qu'on offre aux communautés autochtones qui sont, font partie des nations fondatrices de notre pays l'opportunité de parler leur langue ici et les encourager de faire partie de la gouvernance de notre pays. Merci, M. le Président. Questions et commentaires? Questions and comments? L'honorable député de... Euh, Excuse, euh, Ville-Marie, euh, Sud-Ouest, île des Sœurs. Excuse. Merci, M. le Président. Je veux remercier le membre pour son discours. Uh, Durant son discours, il a alloué à la code talking. Et il est important de remercier cette House que quand le Canada, quand les US needed indigenous languages, uh, we spared no resources in ensuring they were used. And indeed, they were used uh, as code, uh, unbreakable code, unbreakable to the Japanese, unbreakable to the Germans. Uh, when Canada and the U.S. needed the most. So I find it a bitter irony when I try to grasp the objection to the adoption of the support from the Conservatives that their argument would not turn so much on rights uh, or reconciliation, which I, I, I still question their motives, but I believe them on face value, but more on resources and, and money. Uh, it would be bitter irony that these languages, which are now fragilized, fragile, 73 years later, uh, threats of extinction in some cases caused by, by, by omission, by direct action of government and government-related institutions, it would be a bitter irony that they would be, uh, in part, their, 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 their wiping out would be contributed simply because uh, resources were, were, were an issue at hand. Now, these are fragile, fragile languages, Mr. Speaker, and uh, if, you take, if, you, if you take the example of the number of friends that I have that speak Mohawk or Ganyageha, there's about a hundred of them. That's the equivalent of 10 million English speakers, Mr. Mr. Speaker. Uh, 2019 is the, year, is the year of Indigenous languages at the UN. Uh, if the party opposite, if the Conservatives do not believe in the rights, in, in reconciliation, surely they believe in respect, surely they believe in effort, and surely, surely they believe in lifting up languages uh, to the state where they need to be in this, in this era. So uh, on that note, I would like to, to, to ask the member opposite if he could talk about the, the minimal effort that this report is requiring in order to lift these languages to the state that we need to lift them, as the member opposite said, in order to recognize ourselves, the country that we portray abroad to be, in order to recognize ourselves as such. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Laurentie de la Belle, in 65 seconds or less, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm quite privileged that the member for Edith uh, Adville Marie Sud-West, whatever the full writing name is, is not, in fact, on the opposite side of me. We're quite privileged to be on the same side. Um, a couple of quick comments on this. The the, the, when we hear about code-talking languages being unbroken codes for the war, I would like to finally be able to broke the, break those codes and understand them here in this House. I think it's really important that we get there. The fact that, the, that there's one party in this House opposing this change on, frankly, technical grounds, and, and I'm not sure, I, quite frankly, I heard two speeches and they don't make any sense at all. This offers us a roadmap for the four speakers in this House who speak one of these languages. Four. That's all there are. It, we're not talking about 60 people speaking 60 different languages every single day of the place. It's offering the opportunity for them to bring the languages, the cultures, the histories of this country into the place that's supposed to represent each and every one of us. And I think we can't wait longer to do this. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Resuming debate, reprise du débat, the Honourable Member for Skeena Buckley Valley. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to my colleague uh, for his speech and to split the time. I am, I am somewhat reluctant to take uh, the 
the space today because this was a spot intended for my very good friend, the member from Abitibi, James Bay, Nunavik EU, who is uh, delayed in coming. And uh, it was through his championing and my friend from Desete, Mississippi, Mississippi, ha, Churchill River, uh, who have been championing this process along for, in some cases, many, many years. Um, we, are, we are going to be robbed of the wisdom of my friend from Abitibi James Bay. I will make a poor replacement, but I'll do my best to talk about uh, this incredibly important opportunity, uh, and maybe perhaps historic opportunity for us in the House of Commons to maybe be on the right side of history for once. This, uh, this place that we occupy has been the, the figure and the symbol of the country, of uh, the good and the bad of this country, of decisions that have been made in these parliaments that have deeply affected Indigenous peoples for many, many generations, too often to their great cultural, spiritual and economic detriment. Here we have an opportunity to do something good. It's not going to solve everything. It's going to be an answer to some important things. Let me read from the United Nations of the Direct Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, Article 13. Indigenous people have the right to revitalize, use, develop and transmit to future generations their histories, languages, oral traditions, philosophies, writing systems, and literatures, and to designate and retain their own names for communities, places, and persons. And Section 2 says this, and this is important to this debate, because this House has adopted this principle. This House has adopted this UN declaration that says that states will, shall take effective measures to ensure that this right is protected, and also to ensure that Indigenous peoples can understand and be understood in political legal and administrative proceedings were necessary through the provision of interpretation or by other appropriate means. Well, this is that place. If we are going to pay any honouring to the House of Commons passing the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which was also pushed forward by my friend from Abitibi, James Bay, Nunavik EU, then we have to act. Many of us have heard the, the terms from the Prime Minister and many politicians talking about reconciliation. And the place that I come from and represent in northwestern British Columbia, the first question people often ask is, what does that mean? Don't tell me, show me. Reconciliation can be defined in many ways and is often ill-defined or not defined at all. And I believe in showing and demonstrating what it might be. I spoke to my Conservative colleague earlier about what privilege, one small aspect of privilege is as a non-Indigenous person, as an English-speaking person, which is I can move about the world, perform my duties to the best of my ability in my mother tongue without hesitation or pause to express my thoughts and feelings to the best of my ability. I have no barrier between me and that expression, whereas so many people do not have that privilege. And Indigenous people in particular have had that ability supplanted, oppressed and taken away categorically and systemically by the state. That is one of the facets of colonialism. And people can, can brace at that word and say, oh, that's some ancient history. Well, the fact of this country, Canada, which we so love, is that it will remain incomplete in its aspirations until we are able to address some of the fundamental errors we made. And these are long struggles. These are struggles that bridge generation to generation. And as we witness in our lifetime, Mr. Speaker, you and I, watching languages move from threatened to endangered to extinct, and somehow we believe that we bear no responsibility to this, that the arguments are put forward as we discuss this small but important change in how the People's House, this House of Commons, conducts its business. We hear resistance. We hear reasons, we hear reasons bordering on excuses, uh, that the technical challenges of, of accommodating the three or four speakers who might use those interpretation services, the cost concerns for a federal government that spends north of $330 billion a year. Oh, we wouldn't want to deprave some community of their interpreter as if providing interpretation work to Indigenous speakers would somehow hurt Indigenous interpreters. It's ridiculous. We need to not be looking for excuses to say no, but understand and compel ourselves to the reasons to say yes to this report and say yes to this change in the House of Commons. I, uh, I have an incomplete list here, but in northwestern British Columbia, I have had the privilege of hearing Haida, Simshian, 
Gitsan, Niska, Wet'suwet'en, Taltan, Klingit, Carrier, Heltzik, Newhawk, Spoken, at, at what we would call parliaments. When the people gather, when the people feast, when the people celebrate and honour those that they seek to hold up, and when the people are doing their business in the northwest of British Columbia. Because at those feast halls, Parliament is held for the Haida, the Simshian, the Niska, and on down the list. I should, have, I should have started my speech with something I've never said in this house, which is Denize Sakoze Skaize, Tabe Masai, for people to listen to me here today. I and my family occupy Wet'suwet'en territory. Our house is in Wet'suwet'en territory. I'm a Nidu, white guy. Happens to live with uh, and alongside many friends of the Wet'suwet'en nation. And they have welcomed me and my family in ways that I can't properly express without getting uh, even more emotional than this debate feels to me now here today. But the generosity of trying to bridge the gap between non Wet'suwet'en and Wet'suwet'en, in my experience, has been breathtaking in its scope and its determination to treat me as a as a resident of the territories, Gidim Den territories, to accept me as a representative of the Crown, this place, in Wet'suwet'en and other territories. Considering all of the terrible things that people who stood in my place in generations past have done to Indigenous peoples is humbling and remarkable. We often, uh, you'll hear politicians, certainly on the West Coast, but other places, begin their speeches by saying, I, I'm pleased to be here on unceded territory. And sometimes I'm in the audience and I'm wondering, what does that actually mean? Is it just a phrase that, that gets put into a speech for, for politicians to say and then move on to say the things they were going to say anyways? Or that when we recognize unceded territory, we recognize something more. We say that these territories were not ceded. That the imposition of a colonial legal language and morality system has never been recognized, has never been accepted. That we require of Indigenous peoples to move through these systems in order to achieve basic rights and meaning and title. And fighting year after year against various iterations of the government, of the Crown, at the Supreme Court. And, and recently, I heard a story that I think is important from a former colleague who was here during the, the reclaiming of the, the reconstituting of our constitution here in Canada, done by a, a former Prime Minister Trudeau. And in those negotiations with the NDP, Ed Broadbent was a leader at the time, we had in principle accepted the constitution as it was written. But unfortunately for Mr. Broadbent, but fortunately for us, his caucus resisted. This is the plight of being the NDP leader sometimes, I suppose. And there were certain sections that the caucus at that time in the early 80s insisted on being in. One was the rights of women to be declared in the Constitution, and the other was Section 35. And Mr. Broadbent had to go back to Mr. Trudeau and say, we need these in. And there was resistance. There was clear resistance from this place, from this institution, to include Section 35, Indigenous Rights and Title, in our Constitution, which includes things like language in the rights that people bear. And what are we talking about here today? Is the rights of Indigenous people to stand in this place and express themselves without the barrier of having to move through somebody else's language. To have the ability to move and express themselves through their language. And we have the ability to do this. For those that say it's too technical or there might be costs that we can't even imagine, I say this should have been done generations ago. Let's be on the right side of history. Let's not allow these things to stand in our way, because we can do this. This parliament can do this. In 2018, a small but important expression to people, not just Indigenous people, Mr. Speaker, and I'll end here, but to non-Indigenous Canadians, to say this is what the People's House looks like, and this is what the People's House sounds like. To not move in this direction, Canada cannot be the country that it hopes and professes to be. Thank you very much. Questions and comments, the Honourable Member for Winnipeg Centre. I think it's extremely important uh, for people to see themselves in the institutions of the nation state. 
and I have heard many elders say that they are not Canadian citizens. They were only, uh, we were, in, as Indigenous peoples, were only allowed to vote in the 1960s. And I think it's still very difficult as politicians when we go out into, into the rest of Canada to speak with our fellow citizens, many sometimes who are Indigenous, that they don't feel part and parcel of this nation, that they feel ignored. And I think this action that we're taking in this Parliament today is going to go a long way to ensuring that everyone feels included, that we create the nation that we truly deserve for each and every one of us. Now, I've heard uh, the debate, obviously, the member has talked about um, interpreters, how there could be a, you know, that uh, it was mentioned in the debate earlier, there could be an, a shortage of interpreters. But in fact, actually, by us, this institution of parliament requiring more interpreters is going to actually create an industry where more people will now have uh, a, a potential for employment, will be looking for employment, will see the opportunity and the value of learning their language to an extremely high degree so that they can do interpretation at the same time as someone else is speaking. And I think that's extremely, an extremely wonderful development. And with that, Mr. Speaker, I'd just like to throw out a challenge. Next week, the Assembly of First Nations will be meeting in Gatineau for their annual General Assembly. I would like to hear translators as well at those gatherings, not only here in Parliament, but all Indigenous leaders trying to use our language as much as we can, because we have to demonstrate leadership not only here, but everywhere, each and every day, so our children know that it's important. Member for Skeena, Bulkley Valley. So let's, let's, thank you for the question, let's put this so-called barrier to the side of saying that there just simply aren't interpreters to fulfill the role that we would require as Parliament, because that's not what the committee heard. That's not the testimony. It would be paternalistic to suggest to Indigenous Canadians, this is better for you, we don't want to hurt you, by asking for more interpreters to be made available. That's ridiculous. And let me go to this place, because this is my family's experience. I come from Irish heritage. My mother knows just the smattering of Gaelic. And why? Well, because her mother and her grandmother were unable to speak Gaelic at school or in their communities without being punished, without being beaten by the then British governments that occupied their land. So my mother is able to pass to me a few Gaelic expressions, and that's it. And that is the worldview that I am able to express in such a small way, and I feel so much more impoverished by that, because wouldn't it have been something better? But this, this, these excuses, these are excuses to say interpreters are unavailable or this would cause harm to Indigenous people somehow, is simply wrong, and I would argue paternalistic. Questions and comments? Question and comment, the Honourable Member for Edmonton uh, Strathcona. Mr. Speaker, uh, I'd like to thank my, co my colleague from Skeena Buckley Valley. Um, I've had the honour of visiting there, and I know what strong Indigenous communities there are. Um, I wanted to share um, with you here, Mr. Speaker, uh, a powerful experience that I had, two pro powerful experiences, a number that I've had with Indigenous communities. This past summer, I had the honour of travelling with my colleague, who represents Northern Saskatchewan, to a very Indigenous community, both Métis and Cree, I believe. And in that gathering and in between, there wasn't English being talked. I could hear my colleague speaking her language, Dene. It was a beautiful moment because we are most powerful when we speak our language. But I also want to share, when I went to a gathering of the Dene people in Fort Providence, a small community in Northwest Territories, I, can't, I lost count of how many interpreters are there. I mean, Indigenous communities are used to having interpretation, even among themselves. So I wonder if my, my colleague can speak to that. I think he did already, to the absurdity of suggesting the difficulty in finding interpreters of these beautiful Indigenous languages that Canada is grateful to have. The Honourable Member for Skeena Bulkley Valley in 45 seconds or less, right, please. I'll try my best, Mr. Speaker. It is, it is uh, something to see. I've, I've had the privilege of living in other countries and and seeing people who express to me only in their, in their version of English, their attempts at English, and then the switch into the native tongue, and the flourishing, the, the, the stature, the opening up. And where I represent in northwestern British Columbia, my great privilege is to watch that virtually every time I go home, where I get to attend ceremony 
be with people and the expression and the, the openness of being able to be there. I so look forward to the speeches that will come if we pass this resolution, to watch colleagues speak in Indigenous language in their full manner and full expression in the beauty and richness of the languages. That's a day I look forward to, and we shouldn't have to wait any longer for that. Thank you very much. Resuming debate, reprise du débat. Resuming debate, reprise du débat. Is the House ready for the question? Yes. La question est la suivante. Mr. Willette, seconded by Ms. Jolibois, moved that the 66th report of the Standing Committee on Procedure and House Affairs presented on Tuesday, June 19, 2018, be concurred in. Is it the pleasure of the House to adopt the motion? Yes. On, div on division? On division carried. What is it today? Pleasure to do I am Madam Governor Cameron. Presuming consideration of the motion for third 